Hello, and welcome to Work Practice and Administrative Controls and PPE for Nanomaterials. My name is Pete Rayner, and I'm an Associate Professor at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. The learning objectives for this module are that, by the end, learners should be able to choose control options in the context of the hierarchy of control, modify work practices to reduce exposures, recommend administrative control measures, and select appropriate personal protective equipment. Let's start with a definition of control. From Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, the verb form of control can be defined as to reduce the incidence or severity of, especially to innocuous levels. In our case, we want to reduce the severity of exposures to nanomaterials. But what do we consider an innocuous level? Well, an innocuous level might be considered the occupational exposure limit. For nanomaterials, there are a few permissible exposure limits from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, that might apply. There are a few nanomaterial-specific recommended exposure limits from the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, and there can be benchmark exposure levels set internally within an organization to establish an innocuous level. The hierarchy of control, as I define it, has four tiers. The top tier, which is most preferred with all else being equal, is elimination of the workplace hazard. Tier two is engineering controls. Tier three includes both work practice controls and administrative controls. And tier four, the least preferred method for controlling exposure, with all else being equal, is personal protective equipment. Elimination can be defined as the complete removal of the hazard or process that produces it from the workplace. And this is at the top of the hierarchy of control because it completely eliminates the exposure while placing the responsibility for change on someone other than the exposed person. Engineering controls are physical, chemical, or biological changes made to a process or a product that reduce exposures. Like elimination, engineering controls are relatively high on the hierarchy because the responsibility for change is not placed on the exposed person. The hazard is still present in the workplace, but engineering controls are broadly effective at reducing exposures for everyone in a work area at the same time. Among the concepts used in engineering controls are substitution of one material or process for another, automation, isolation, ventilation, and control equipment. We will talk about each of these concepts in more detail shortly. Work practice and administrative controls are next on the hierarchy. Work practice controls are changes in how tasks are performed, whereas administrative controls are changes in when, where, or by whom tasks are performed in order to reduce exposures. They are lower on the hierarchy than engineering controls because both management and the exposed person are at least partially responsible for putting changes into effect. Last on the hierarchy of controls is personal protective equipment, or PPE. These are devices and clothing used by an individual to reduce his or her own exposure. PPE is last on the hierarchy because the exposed individuals are responsible for change. They must put on and use the devices and clothing properly each and every time for them to be effective. This is very challenging, which is why PPE is at the bottom. Let's look at some examples of controls in each of these different tiers. Examples of elimination, where a hazardous process or agent is completely removed from a workplace, include moving an air compressor outside from an indoor location so that the vapors, particles, and noise produced by the compressor are eliminated from the work area. A salvage firm that chose to no longer purchase and cut up scrap bulk fuel tanks due to concerns that this was an explosion hazard. And a company that decided to purchase sawn wood rather than cutting wood on site to eliminate electrical and injury hazards. Moving on to engineering controls, We'll look at some examples separately for substitution, automation, isolation, ventilation, and control equipment. Whereas elimination gets rid of a hazardous process or agent entirely, substitution requires an engineering solution to replace the process or agent with something else. One example is replacing perchloroethylene, or PERC, based dry cleaning with processes that use less hazardous solvents. This is a big focus in the city of Minneapolis right now to both improve workplace conditions and reduce outdoor air pollution. 
Other examples include using poultry cutting knives with ergonomically designed curved handles rather than traditional knives with straight handles in order to prevent musculoskeletal disorders, and utilizing water-based paints rather than oil-based paints in auto body repair to avoid exposures to solvents. Examples of automation include robotic arms for spray painting in automobile factories that apply paint more uniformly while also reducing worker exposures to paint droplets, and mechanical patient transfer devices in assisted living facilities to move patients without putting the staff at risk of lifting injuries. Another great example that I've seen is a computerized saw in a custom cabinetry shop. This advanced machine was a tremendous source of pride for this business because they were able to cut cabinetry pieces with much greater precision than they could previously, which served as a selling point to clients, while also reducing the risk of injuries to the machine operator because the operator was mostly controlling the computer rather than having to control a large piece of wood. Isolation is another engineering control. Automated metalworking machines often generate potentially hazardous mist droplets from coolants applied to cutting or drilling processes. Enclosures are built around these machines to isolate them and reduce the risk of workers being exposed to the mist. Caps on agricultural vehicles protect farm workers from dust and pesticide exposures. Lead shielding can protect workers and others from x-ray and gamma radiation sources. Ventilation is used to protect workers from chemical and biological agents. Examples include local exhaust ventilation attached to enclosures around metalworking machines that draw coolant mist out of the workplace, laboratory hoods and biosafety cabinets, and airborne infection isolation rooms in hospitals that are ventilated so that they are negatively pressured relative to surrounding areas, preventing airborne infectious agents produced by patients from getting out of the room. In addition, simple actions such as opening a window or a rolling door or turning on a fan can be considered ventilation controls. The last engineering control category is control equipment. One example is the mist collectors in local exhaust ventilation systems that are attached to the enclosures around metalworking machines. These devices remove the metalworking fluid mist droplets before they are released to the outdoor environment. Other examples include cabin air filters on farm equipment and pressure relief valves for ammonia refrigeration systems that control the escape of ammonia should the system become overpressurized rather than allowing an explosive situation to develop. Additional control equipment that are relevant in our daily lives includes automobile mufflers and door locks. Moving down the hierarchy of control, let's look at work practice controls. Examples include proper hand washing, laboratory safety procedures that students and staff are trained to follow at colleges and universities, adhering to marked walkways on factory floors in order to avoid collisions with vehicles, training workers to lift by bending their knees and not by lifting with their back in order to reduce back injuries, and using wet cleaning methods instead of dry cleaning methods in postal facilities to prevent re-aerosolization of dust. This last example has been an emphasis since 2001 when the anthrax spores passed through the postal system and worker exposure risk was thought to have been increased by the use of pressurized air jets to clean dust from sorting machines. Examples of administrative controls include rotating jobs at a poultry processing facility to minimize ergonomic risks, moving hazardous activities to late shifts when fewer workers are present to minimize the population of workers who are exposed, limits on truck driver hours to be sure that they are rested and at less risk of contributing to vehicle incidents, limiting loads that workers are allowed to carry to reduce the risk of musculoskeletal and back injuries, and not allowing agricultural workers to enter fields during restricted entry intervals after pesticides are applied. The Environmental Protection Agency has established these intervals to reduce the risk of elevated exposures to pesticides. Finally, lowest on the hierarchy of control is personal protective equipment. Examples include safety glasses or goggles, hard hats, safety shoes, respirators, gloves, chemical protective clothing that can cover the entire body, and hearing protection. We're not going to spend time on hearing protection in this lesson, but it's certainly an important example of PPE. Let's spend some time talking about personal protective equipment, starting with the question, what is the role of PPE? According to OSHA, when engineering, work practice, and administrative controls are not feasible, 
or do not provide sufficient protection, employers must provide PPE to their employees and ensure its use. An important point in that statement is that the employer must make sure that the workers are using their PPE. It's the employer's responsibility to make sure it happens. There are a variety of standards that are relevant to personal protective equipment. In particular, in Title 29 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 1910, Subparts G, H, and I, there are sections that apply specifically to PPE. These include Section 95 for occupational noise exposure, Section 120 for hazardous waste operations and emergency response, and then Sections 132 to 138 where there is discussion of general PPE requirements, eye and face protection, respiratory protection, head protection, foot protection, protection from electrical exposures, and hand protection. There are separate PPE standards that apply to the maritime and construction industries as well. We will focus on the general industry standards as those are where PPE relevant to nanomaterials will be covered in most situations. Under the standards, both employers and employees have responsibilities to work together to ensure the greatest possible protection for workers. In general, employers are responsible for performing a hazard assessment in order to identify and control hazards, identifying and providing appropriate PPE for their workers, training workers in the use and care of the personal protective equipment, maintaining the personal protective equipment, which includes replacing worn and damaged PPE, and periodically reviewing, updating, and evaluating the effectiveness of their PPE program. A key point is that it is the responsibility of the employer to provide and pay for the PPE in most cases, and then pay to replace it as needed. Employees are responsible for wearing their personal protective equipment properly, attending training sessions on PPE, following directions for caring for, cleaning, and maintaining their PPE, and informing a supervisor when their PPE needs repair. What is the training that is required for workers? Employees who are required to use PPE must be trained to know at least the following, when the PPE is necessary, what type of personal protective equipment is necessary, how to properly put on, take off, adjust, and wear their PPE, the limitations of the PPE, especially when can it be used and when must the worker use something else that may be more protective, the proper care and maintenance of their PPE, the useful life of their PPE, and how to dispose of their PPE at the end of its useful life. Let's talk about requirements for specific types of PPE, starting with head protection. Head protection is needed when objects may fall from above and strike a worker's head, when fixed objects such as pipes or beams are present upon which workers may bump their heads, and when electrical conductors are nearby that can come in contact with the head. OSHA standards require that head protection must comply with one of several American National Standards Institute ANSI, standards for hard hats, either the most recent one or one of a couple that are older. Hard hats are selected from among two types and three classes. Type 1 hard hats provide shock absorbance, protection from objects falling from above and from pipes and beams that are overhead, as well as resistance to penetration by falling objects. Type 2 hard hats provide both shock absorbance and resistance to penetration by falling objects, and also lateral protection, protection from the side, which comes in the form of extra impact absorbent padding on the side of the hard hats. All hard hats are resistant to water and fire. The three classes are defined according to their minimal rating for electrical protection. Class C hard hats are not rated to provide electrical protection. Class G hard hats are for general service with the ability to provide protection up to 2,200 volts. Class E hard hats are for electrical work and are able to provide protection up to 20,000 volts or 20 kilovolts. Many, but not all, hard hats that you find for purchase are rated to comply with all three classes. This image is of an ordinary, everyday Type 1 classes C, G, and E hard hat. Type 1 hard hats can also be customized for workers, like this one that looks like a Minnesota Vikings football helmet. This is an image of the inside of a Type 2 hard hat. We see the suspension system that provides shock absorption for impacts from above that is present in both Type 1 and Type 2 hard hats, 
while around the circumference we see the extra padding that provides protection from lateral impact, which is only present in type 2 hard hats. Protection for the eyes and face may be needed in the presence of flying dust or particles such as metal shavings, wood chips, wool fibers, or even nanopowders, acids or other caustic liquids that might splash, blood or other body fluids that might splash, or intense light from sources such as welding arcs and lasers. As with hard hats, OSHA standards require eye and face protection to comply with one of three ANSI standards. Types of eye and face protection include clear and tinted goggles, safety glasses, and face shields. Selection criteria include, obviously, the ability to protect against the identified hazard. This sounds simple, but if workers might face a sharp, solid object traveling at high velocity, some types of eye and face protection will be insufficient, so we must make sure that the PPE is strong enough, physically and chemically, to protect the workers. Other criteria include comfort, minimizing restrictions to vision and movement, durability, ease of cleaning and disinfection, and the effects on other PPE. For example, we must be sure that eye and face protection is compatible with respiratory protection and hearing protection. Types of eye and face protectors include safety glasses, and we see a couple of examples here. Most safety glasses that can be purchased now are a little sleeker and more stylish than they were 10 or 20 years ago and we can get safety glasses that are also shaded so that workers can wear them outdoors in sunlight. Safety glasses are used for moderate impact from particles produced during jobs like carpentry, woodworking, grinding, and scaling. They are made with metal or plastic safety frames. For most operations, some sort of protection from the side is required. This protection can be integrated into the glasses as shown in the images, or it can be provided by side shields. Safety glasses, like the slightly older model shown in this picture, can have prescription lenses. Goggles protect eyes and eye sockets, and the facial area immediately surrounding the eyes, from impacts, dust, and splashes. Some goggles are able to fit over corrective lenses, and some have vents in them to keep humidity from building up inside. These vented goggles should not be used in situations where splashing liquid might be able to get into the goggles through the vents. Face shields can protect the face from nuisance dusts and splashes or sprays from hazardous liquids, but in general, they are not able to protect workers from impact hazards, so they cannot replace safety glasses in many cases. Workers may need foot and leg protection when they handle heavy objects like barrels or use tools that can roll or fall onto their feet, from sharp objects such as nails or spikes that can be stepped on, from hot surfaces, and on wet and slippery walking surfaces. According to OSHA regulations, protective footwear must comply with either of two older ANSI standards or a pair of newer ASTM standards. ASTM was formerly the American Society for Testing and Materials. It's now just referred to as ASTM International. Types of foot and leg protection include safety shoes and leggings. Leggings are commonly used, for example, by workers near molten metals that may splash and injure both legs and feet. Safety shoes are the more common PPE that we think about for feet. Special electrically conductive shoes can be used in potentially explosive situations to avoid static electricity. In those situations, workers should not use foot powder or silk, wool, or nylon socks, and they should remove those electrically conductive shoes when the task is completed because they will not provide protection against electrical hazards. Those working with electrical hazards should wear electrical hazard safety toe shoes to insulate themselves from electric shock. The electrical insulation properties of the shoes can be compromised if they become wet, worn, or embedded with metal particles. Safety shoes are the most common type of foot protection. Typical features include impact resistant toes, heat and slip resistant soles, metal insoles on the bottom to prevent puncture wounds, and insulation for heat and cold. Soles are generally made from materials with low electrical conductivity to protect from electrical hazards. Safety shoes can have metatarsal guards as shown in this image where part of the shoe or a part strapped to the outside of the shoe protects the instep, the top of the foot, from impact and compression hazards. 
Workers may also wear chemically protective footwear like these boots that may not provide protection from injury hazards, but can provide protection from chemicals that might be able to splash onto the workers. There are also boots that offer protection against both injury and chemical hazards like the ones pictured here. These boots have steel toes, slip resistant soles, and some insulation as well as being chemically protective. In many cases, and in particular for those working with nanomaterials, chemically protective boots and safety shoes may be unnecessary. Disposable shoe covers worn over regular street shoes may be sufficient. The shoe covers are put on before entering the area where nanomaterials may be present, and they are removed and disposed of before exiting the area. This works best with an anteroom where workers have a space between outside the work area and the inside to put on and take off PPE. Let's talk next about respiratory protection, which can be especially critical for those working with nanomaterials. Respirator use is governed by the OSHA respirator standard, which is Title 29, Part 1910, Section 134 of the Code of Federal Regulations. This section states that respirators can be used in contaminated air or in oxygen depleted atmospheres, which are defined as having less than 19.5% oxygen rather than the typical 21% oxygen. Respirators may be used when engineering controls, which are preferable according to the hierarchy of control, are not feasible, or as engineering controls are being implemented. Feasibility can be hard to define, but often it's considered to be when engineering controls are too expensive in general, or when they would be needed for tasks that are performed only rarely. Employer duties under the respirator standard include using engineering controls wherever feasible, providing and paying for appropriate respirators for workers, ensuring the use of the appropriate respirators, instituting a respiratory protection program, and identifying an administrator for the respiratory protection program by name. There are two broad categories of respirators, air purifying respirators and atmosphere supplying respirators. Air purifying respirators include particulate respirators, gas and vapor respirators, respirators that protect against both particles and gases and vapors, and also powered air purifying respirators. Atmosphere supplying respirators include air supplied respirators, self-contained breathing apparatus, or SCBAs, and respirators that combine these two approaches. Respirator selection is based largely on the concentration of the contaminant or contaminants of concern, the permissible exposure limit or another occupational exposure limit, and something called the Assigned Protection Factor, APF, that we will talk about later. Only pressure demand SCBAs or combination respirators should be used in atmospheres that are IDLH or immediately dangerous to life and health. In these situations, we want to be able to count on having a tank filled with air rather than relying on air being supplied through a hose from an air compressor that could be cut or become kinked. It's important to note that in the US, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, certifies respirators and respiratory protection must be certified to be considered legal. Air purifying respirators use filters and cartridges to remove contaminants from air passing from the outside of the respirator to the inside. The image on the left shows a half mask elastomeric respirator. We can see that the half mask covers the nose and mouth of the worker and that he breathes through two cartridges in the sides of the mask. On the right, we see a full face piece elastomeric respirator. Like the half mask respirator, this one has two cartridges through which the air passes and is cleaned as the worker breathes. The full face piece covers the eyes of the wearer in addition to the nose and mouth. Another category of air purifying respirators is filtering face pieces, respirators for which the filter is an integral part of the face piece or the entire face piece is composed of the filtering medium. There are many different types of filtering face piece respirators. The image on the left shows a face piece that is formed into a cupped shape that fits over a worker's nose, mouth, and chin. The image on the right shows a filtering face piece that is flat coming out of the box, and then the wearer forms it into a shape that fits over the nose, mouth, and chin. We have powered air purifying respirators, more commonly known as PAPRs. These are air purifying respirators that use a blower to draw contaminated air surrounding a worker through filters and or cartridges. In the image on the left, 
The case with filters, cartridges, and a blower is on the hip of the wearer. The blower is pulling air through the air purifying elements and then sending the air through the hose to a tight-fitting facepiece or a loose-fitting facepiece or hood. This is a key feature of Pappers. The opportunity to utilize looser fitting face pieces or hoods, like the hood in the image on the right, means that workers who have facial hair can wear respiratory protection without needing to shave off their beards and mustaches. Many filters and cartridges are available for air purifying respirators. The image shows several full face piece and half mask elastomeric respirators, along with a whole bunch of filters and cartridges that can protect against a range of different hazards. We have filters for particles, cartridges that contain sorbents to collect gases or vapors, and cartridges that contain a filter layer on top of a sorbent layer. Different manufacturers have their own systems. The second image shows products from a manufacturer that are different than the products from a competitor in the first image. Currently, we must purchase face pieces, filters, and cartridges from a single manufacturer because the systems are not compatible with each other. In particular, the manner in which the filters and cartridges are attached to the face pieces is unique to each manufacturer. Cartridges are color coded according to the material that is removed. The color magenta, or pink, is a designation for what we call P100 filters, which is the highest efficiency category for respirator filters. Less efficient filters are generally white. In this third image, we see the colors for cartridges containing sorbents that capture different gases or vapors. For example, cartridges with black labels collect organic vapors, whereas those with white labels capture acid gases. The cartridges on the left side of this third image have P100 filters, designated by magenta, as well as sorbent underneath, so that a worker can be protected simultaneously against particle exposures and an exposure to certain types of gases or vapors. Respirator filters are designated according to both their oil resistance and their minimum efficiency. For oil resistance, the designations are N for not resistant to oil, R for resistant to oil for at least an eight hour workday, and P for oil proof so that they will never be affected by oily aerosols. The minimum efficiency designations are 95 for at least 95% efficiency for all particle sizes, 99 for at least 99% efficiency for all particle sizes, and 100 for at least 99.97% efficiency for all particle sizes. N95, for example, means that a respirator filter is at least 95% efficient for all particle sizes, although it is not resistant to oil aerosols. The designations have no relevance for the respirator fit to the face. They are only a designation of efficiency of the filter medium itself. Moving on to atmosphere supplying respirators, our first example is a supplied air respirator, which uses an air compressor to supply air through a long hose to an air regulator attached to a tight fitting face piece. Examples of these systems are shown in the images. A self-contained breathing apparatus, or SCBA, is an atmosphere supplying respirator for which the source of the breathing air is designed to be carried by the worker in a tank on his or her back. The images show a firefighter and another worker with SCBA systems that include the air tanks connected by hose to air regulators attached to tight fitting face pieces. There are also combination respirators, which are supplied air respirator systems that include an escape tank, a small tank that a worker may wear on the hip. If the air coming through the hose from the air compressor stops for any reason, the wearer hears a warning sound and the regulator will automatically switch over to the small escape tank to give the wearer enough time to get out of the dangerous atmosphere. Assigned protection factors are the factors by which a worker's exposure can be considered to be reduced by wearing a certain classification of respirator. This table of assigned protection factors comes from the OSHA Respiratory Protection Standard. Roll labels are for various types of respirators and include air purifying respirators, PAPRs, supplied air respirators, and SCBAs. Column headers represent the type of mask or face piece worn by a worker. These include quarter masks, which are not used a lot, half masks, which include elastomeric respirators as well as filtering face pieces, full face pieces, helmets and hoods, and loose fitting face pieces. 
By looking in the row for the appropriate type of respirator and the column containing the type of mask or face piece, we can identify the assigned protection factor. For example, a half mask air purifying respirator, like a half mask elastomeric respirator or a filtering face piece, will have an assigned protection factor, or APF, of 10. An air purifying respirator with a full face piece will have an assigned protection factor of 50. Powered air purifying respirators with tight fitting full face pieces offer higher levels of protection with an APF of 1000. With a loose fitting hood, the assigned protection factor for a PAPR can still be 1000 if there is sufficient evidence provided by the respirator manufacturer that this rating is appropriate. The highest level of protection comes from a self-contained breathing apparatus with certain types of regulators, which have an assigned protection factor of 10,000. How do we select a respirator? The first step is to measure the contaminant concentration in the air. Next, we divide the concentration by an appropriate occupational exposure limit, whether that is a permissible exposure limit, a threshold limit value, or an internal exposure level established by a company. This quotient is the hazard ratio. Then, we select a respirator with a signed protection factor that is greater than or equal to the hazard ratio. Let's look at an example. Let's say we have a titanium dioxide nanoparticle exposure concentration that is 1.32 milligrams per cubic meter. In its current intelligence bulletin for occupational exposure to titanium dioxide, NIOSH set a recommended exposure limit of 0.3 mg per cubic meter for titanium dioxide nanoparticles. Recalling that the hazard ratio is equal to the concentration divided by the occupational exposure limit, in this case the recommended exposure limit, we have 1.32 mg per cubic meter divided by 0.3 mg per cubic meter, which equals 4.4. Therefore, we must choose a respirator with an assigned protection factor greater than or equal to 4.4. I'd recommend a filtering face piece or a half mask elastomeric respirator with particulate filters, both of which have an APF of 10. OSHA requires a respiratory protection program in workplaces where respirators are worn. What must a respiratory protection program include? First and foremost, it must be written down and be specific to a worksite. It cannot be just a general plan. It must be tailored to the worksite. It must describe the roles and responsibilities for the administrator, management, and employees, and indicate how respirators will be selected and issued. The program must have provisions for medical evaluations of workers required to wear respirators and for testing to be sure that the respirators fit the workers who must wear them. It must describe how the organization will ensure that workers use their respirators properly, as well as how workers will inspect, clean, maintain, and store their respirators. If SCBAs are required, the plan must describe how suitable compressed air will be provided for the tanks. The plan must also address worker training for hazards and use of respiratory protection, program evaluation, and record keeping requirements. Let's talk in greater detail about a few of these key elements of a respiratory protection program, starting with medical evaluations. Wearing a respirator can adversely affect the health of some workers. It can exacerbate pulmonary and cardiac conditions, increase heat stress, influence vision, hearing, and sense of smell, irritate the skin locally, and cause adverse psychological reactions. The worst of these effects must be avoided by performing a medical evaluation prior to fit testing and use of a respirator. The medical evaluation does not generally require a medical examination. It usually takes the form of a physician or other licensed healthcare professional evaluating a medical questionnaire filled out by a potential respirator wearer. The requirements for the questionnaire are specified in Appendix C of the standard. It should be noted that asbestos workers are required to have more extensive medical testing than other wearers of respiratory protection. Fit testing is conducted to ensure that an appropriate brand, model, and size of respirator is selected for each user, that the respirator is comfortable, that it is compatible with other types of PPE that the worker must wear, and to fulfill OSHA requirements. Fit testing is required for all tight fitting face pieces that must be worn by workers in order to be able to work in contaminated atmospheres. 
Testing must occur before initial use of a respirator, and then thereafter, at least annually, whenever there is a physical change that occurs, such as an injury to the face or a significant weight change, or whenever a new model of respirator is to be used. There are a couple of different types of fit tests. Qualitative fit tests in which the wearer tries to sense the odor of a vapor or the taste of particles that would infiltrate a poor fitting face piece. And quantitative fit tests that use an instrument that counts atmospheric particles inside and outside of a face piece to measure the amount of leakage. Training is required for workers enrolled in a respiratory protection program. Initial training includes why respirators are necessary in this workplace, how improper use, fit, and maintenance can compromise the utility of a respirator, the capabilities and limitations of the respirator that will be worn, how to use respirators in emergency situations, how to inspect, put on, remove, use, and check the seal of a respirator, how to maintain and store a respirator, how to recognize medical signs and symptoms that may limit or prevent the effective use of a respirator, and the general requirements of the respiratory protection standard. Retraining is required at least annually. Sometimes workers may choose to wear respirators for their own peace of mind, even when they are not required to according to relevant occupational exposure limits. Even if respirators are not required, the organization must provide some training if it gives workers the option to wear respirators. It can be daunting to write a respiratory protection program from scratch. Fortunately, there are some written program examples that can get us started. OSHA has a publication, Small Entity Compliance Guide for the Respiratory Protection Standard, at the link shown, that has an example respiratory protection program that can be a starting point for organizations. Another useful resource is from the website of the Michigan Occupational Safety and Health Administration, where they have a sample program for general industry. Most workers in nanotechnology industries must protect their hands and arms from exposure to nanomaterials. More broadly, worker hands and arms require protection from burns, bruises, cuts, and abrasions, punctures, and especially chemicals and biological agents. Many types of gloves are available for hand and arm protection. Fabric gloves protect against dirt, slivers, chafing, and abrasions. Gloves made from leather, canvas, metal mesh, and synthetic materials protect against cuts, burns, and heat. Most common for nanotechnology are chemical and liquid resistant gloves made from a variety of materials. Coated fabric gloves can offer some protection from chemical, physical, and injury hazards simultaneously. Among the many types of chemical resistant gloves are butyl, nitrile, and neoprene gloves. These are all available in different thicknesses. Gloves made from laminated polymer films with brand names like 4-H, Silver Shield, and Barrier are the most broadly protective gloves against a wide range of chemicals. However, they do not fit the hand very tightly, so they may not be the best choice for some tasks, even though they offer a high level of protection. Other types of gloves include PVC, polyvinyl chloride, PVA, polyvinyl alcohol, rubber, and Phyton. How do we select from among these many different types of gloves? Manufacturers provide data online about the effects of different chemicals on their gloves because some chemicals may degrade or permeate certain types of glove materials. Degradation is rated according to standard tests on a scale from not rated to poor, fair, good, and excellent. There are two measures related to permeation. Breakthrough time is an indication of how long it takes for chemicals to get through a glove material usually in terms of minutes or hours. Once breakthrough has occurred, the permeation rate of chemicals through the gloves can be measured in units of micrograms per centimeter squared per minute or per hour. Another factor to consider when selecting a glove material is dexterity and what type of job tasks workers must perform. Do they need gloves that fit tightly to their hands to allow them to do fine work? In this case, workers may need thin gloves but they may need to change out these gloves more frequently than they would if they wore thicker gloves that provide less dexterity. Every manufacturer provides glove resources online. This is usually the best information available regarding glove options. Here we see websites for four of the largest glove manufacturers in the U.S., although there are other manufacturers too. The best thing to do when we need to select a particular type of 
glove for a particular type of chemical is to visit manufacturer websites and look for their guidance. We can often input a chemical of interest into a manufacturer's database and get back information on the suitable types of gloves that they sell that will protect against the chemical. We can also compare across sites to see which brands and models of gloves are best in the standard tests related to degradation and permeation. Many workers in the nanotechnology industry and elsewhere need body protection. Hazards include physical and injury agents such as intense heat, splashes from hot metals and liquids, impacts from tools, machinery and materials, and cuts. We are also concerned with chemical, biological, and radiation hazards. Many different types of body protection are available ranging from vests, jackets, and aprons to surgical gowns, coveralls, and fully encapsulating suits. A wide range of materials are available, including treated wool and cotton that protect against dust, abrasions, irritation, and fire, leather which protects against dry heat and flame, duck or woven cotton that can protect against heavy, sharp, and rough objects, disposable paper-like fiber suits that can protect against dust and splashes, and rubber, neoprene, and polymer materials that protect primarily against chemicals. This slide shows some of the many types of protective clothing, such as laboratory coats, surgical gowns, and non-woven polyethylene coveralls, the most common brand name is Tyvek. Coveralls can also include hoods and shoe coverings integrated into the suit. Higher levels of chemical protection are provided by suits like this Tychem brand suit. Fully encapsulating chemical protective suits provide the highest level of protection. We often think of chemical protective clothing and associated PPE such as gloves, shoes, and respiratory protection in terms of levels of protection defined by the National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Level A is the highest level of protection, whereas level D is the lowest. Level A is for substances presenting severe or immediately dangerous to life and health, IDLH, respiratory and dermal hazards in a gaseous state, for substances presenting dermal hazards in a liquid or solid state, in low oxygen levels or in unknown situations. Level B is for substances that present severe respiratory hazards in a gaseous state, for dermal hazards in a liquid or solid state, or in low oxygen levels. So the main difference between level B and level A is that level B does not protect against gaseous agents that are dermal hazards. Level C is for substances that present respiratory hazards that can be reduced using air purifying respirators and also offers some splash protection from liquids. The main difference between level C and level B is that level C requires only an air purifying respirator, whereas level B and level A require use of an SCBA. Finally, level D does not protect against significant health hazards. The clothing only offers nuisance protection. Level A protection is shown in this image. It features a fully encapsulating suit with no vapor penetration. It has special seams and zippers that prevent vapor from penetrating into the suit at all. Gloves are integrated into the suit with a second layer of gloves required to be worn underneath. Chemical protective boots are also integrated into the suit. Inside the suit, the worker wears a self-contained breathing apparatus. Nothing should be able to penetrate this highest level, level A, of protection. This is level B protection. It looks a lot like level A in many situations. The hump on the back is where the SCBA air tank goes. We didn't see this in the level A photo because the image just shows the worker from the front but a level A suit has a similar hump to provide space for an SCBA tank. Level B features an SCBA, a hooded chemical protective suit, double gloves, and chemical protective boots, but the gloves and the boots are not integrated into the suit, and the suit does not have the special zippers or seams that are part of fully encapsulating suits. This is also level B protection. 
The workers, in this case law enforcement agents in a training exercise, wear SCBAs, hooded chemical protective suits, double gloves, and chemical protective boots. We can see that the workers have used duct tape to seal the gloves and boots to the chemical protective suit to prevent leakage through the wrist and lower leg areas. For level C protection, the worker wears an air purifying respirator instead of an SCBA. Everything else looks similar to level B protection, including a hooded chemical protective suit, double gloves that are not integrated into the suit, and chemical protective boots that are also not integrated into the suit. Level D protection includes basically coveralls and chemical protective boots for nuisance protection. Material selection criteria for chemical protective clothing are similar to the glove selection criteria we looked at earlier. There are data available from tests of degradation, breakthrough time, and permeation rate as the materials are exposed to different chemicals. What is different is that there can also be data available for penetration of materials through the clothing. For example, we might need to know the ability of gases or liquids to get through the seams or zippers of a particular chemical protective suit. DuPont is a major supplier of chemical protective clothing. They have a catalog at the link shown that provides information about their different brands of protective clothing and the chemicals against which the clothing materials will protect workers. It's a terrific reference. Let's talk now specifically about the different administrative and work practice controls and personal protective equipment that can be applied in nanotechnology workplaces. Administrative controls for engineered nanomaterials include educating workers on the safe handling of nanomaterials, providing information about the hazardous properties of nanomaterials and the products that are made from them, encouraging workers to use hand washing facilities prior to eating, smoking, and leaving the work site, establishing procedures like the use of buffer areas such as anti-rooms and standard decontamination processes for workers to ensure that engineered nanomaterials are not transported away from the work area inadvertently on skin and clothing, and providing facilities for showering and changing clothes before workers leave the work site. Kulinowski and Lippi have provided recommendations through the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences Worker Education and Training Program for the training of nanomaterial workers. They suggested four modules for training workers about nanomaterial risks. The first module would provide an introduction to nanotechnology. The second would consider environmental health and safety impacts of nanoparticles. The third would be on application of traditional risk management approaches to protect workers handling nanoparticles. And the fourth would consider regulatory and voluntary approaches specific to nanoparticles. In their document, Kulinowski and Lippi list learning objectives for each of the modules. Having safety data sheets available to workers is an important administrative control. The Globally Harmonized System Updated Requirements of Safety Data Sheets, or SDSs, to include the 16 required sections shown here. SDSs must identify the material with items like a product identifier and a manufacturer and distributor name identify the hazards associated with the material, list composition information, describe first aid and firefighting measures, identify measures for accidental releases including emergency procedures, protective equipment, and proper methods of containment and cleanup, describe safe handling and storage procedures including precautions for non-compatible chemicals, Identify exposure controls and personal protection requirements with a listing of relevant occupational exposure limits. List physical and chemical properties. Describe the stability and reactivity of the material. Provide toxicological and ecological information. Recommend considerations for disposal. Provide transport and regulatory information and list other information, including the date of preparation of the SDS, as well as the most recent revision dates. For safety data sheets to be useful, nanomaterials must be stored in containers that are labeled so that workers know exactly what they are handling. Labels should not fall off without being replaced, and they should not become so worn that they can no longer be read. 
Proper labeling of storage containers is really critical. Work practice controls for engineered nanomaterials include avoiding handling nanomaterials in open air when the nanomaterials are in a free particle state like a nanopowder, storing nanomaterials in tightly sealed containers whenever possible, cleaning work areas at the end of each work shift at a minimum using either wet wiping methods or a HEPA filtered vacuum cleaner, disposing of all waste material in compliance with regulations, and avoiding storing and consuming food or beverages in work areas when nanomaterials are handled. One of the key work practices is to minimize energy inputs when handling nanomaterials. These images and graphs come from Tsai et al, and they show a laboratory worker transferring nanoalumina powder using a spatula on the left and pouring or dumping the nanoalumina powder from one beaker to another on the right. In the graphs, the different colors are associated with different positions of the sash on the laboratory hood. In all cases, higher particle number concentrations were produced by energetically pouring or dumping the nanopowder than by using a spatula to more gently transfer it. The greater energy input provided by pouring the powder resulted in higher concentrations, suggesting that minimizing energy input is important when handling nanomaterials. Cleaning of nanomaterial work areas is an activity for which energy input and the proximity of workers are especially critical. Wet wiping methods are best when cleaning equipment or when trying to clean up nanomaterial spills. In particular, using a disposable wet wipe that you can place in a hazardous waste container may be preferable to using a sponge that needs substantial cleaning prior to reuse. HEPA filtered vacuums are okay because the air that emerges from them will be filtered and hopefully not release nanoparticles into the workplace air. It is important to remember that the act of vacuuming can potentially resuspend settled particles. For this reason, HEPA filtered vacuums are less preferable than wet wiping methods. Dry wiping and sweeping are not recommended because these cleaning methods can aerosolize particles. Air jets must be avoided under any circumstances as they are high energy devices and easily aerosolize particles from surfaces. In addition, vacuums without HEPA filters should never be used in nanotechnology workplaces because some of the vacuumed particles will pass through the vacuum cleaner bags and be released into the workplace air. NIOSH has published recommendations for personal protective equipment for use when working with engineered nanomaterials. They include long pants without cuffs and a long sleeve shirt, a laboratory coat or coveralls, especially a lab coat with cuffs and Tyvek type wrist covers to protect the skin, as well as lab coats not made from woven cotton, nitrile or other chemically impervious gloves, but not latex gloves, closed toe shoes made from a low permeability material such as leather or disposable over the shoe booties, safety glasses, goggles, or potentially a face shield, although a face shield alone does not protect against unbound nanoparticles, and then, finally, a respirator. This is the assembly of PPE recommended by NIOSH for those working with engineered nanomaterials. How effectively does this PPE work to prevent worker exposures to nanoparticles? Let's talk first about nanoparticles and protective clothing. Golansky et al. measured the ability of airborne nanoparticles to pass through different fabrics at low airflow velocities under a pressure differential, basically using the fabrics like a filter. Their justification for this was that, as people move around, clothing fabrics move relative to the air and act like filters. The authors tested a woven cotton fabric and non-woven polypropylene and polyethylene. Non-woven polyethylene is similar to Tyvek. The figure shows the percentage of particles penetrating through the three fabrics as a function of nanoparticle diameter. The top curve on the figure is for the woven cotton fabric, showing that it allowed through the greatest percentage of particles. The polypropylene non-woven fabric was next, and the high-density polyethylene non-woven fabric allowed the fewest particles through. These data show that the non-woven fabrics are more protective than woven fabrics against airborne nanoparticles moving through the fabrics. In another paper, Golansky and co-authors tested woven fabrics and non-woven polyethylene Tyvek-like fabrics 
for their ability to remove nanoparticles as the particles diffuse through the fabrics. So, rather than having air movement, the authors were tracking the ability of nanoparticles to diffuse over time through the fabrics by Brownian motion. They found that many more 10 nanometer particles were able to diffuse through the woven cotton and polyester fabrics than through the non-woven polyethylene fabrics by roughly three orders of magnitude. These data suggest the importance of using coveralls made from non-woven fabrics like Tyvek rather than lab coats or street clothing made from woven fabrics to reduce the risk of contamination by nanoparticles of the skin and clothing underneath. Golansky and co-authors also looked at the ability of nanoparticles to penetrate through nitrile gloves. Initially, they found that nanoparticles can lodge on the surface and in microscopic crevices in protective gloves. When they measured the ability of nanoparticles to penetrate through nitrile gloves by diffusion, they obtained the results shown in the figure. The figure illustrates titanium dioxide nanoparticle concentration as a function of time, first on the upstream side of nitrile gloves where they introduce the particles, and then on the downstream side of the gloves. The nanoparticle concentration was very high upstream from the gloves and then dropped to zero on the downstream side. The nanoparticles were unable to diffuse through the gloves. Vinchez et al. measured the ability of titanium dioxide nanoparticles in a liquid suspension to penetrate butyl rubber and nitrile gloves undergoing deformations every five minutes. The deformations were intended to simulate the movement of worker fingers. The authors tracked particle penetration over a period of several hours. As shown in the figure, through three hours, neither the butyl rubber nor the nitrile gloves showed any sign of penetration of the suspended nanoparticles. After five hours, however, the titanium dioxide nanoparticles were able to pass through the nitrile gloves, but not the butyl rubber gloves. These results suggest that there is at least a possibility that nanoparticles in suspension can penetrate some types of gloves, but the likelihood of worker hands being directly in contact with suspensions of nanoparticles for as long as five or even three hours is low. The test conditions represent an extreme situation. On balance, the limited data available suggests that chemical protective gloves are highly effective at reducing the risk of dermal nanoparticle exposures to worker hands. How effective are filtering facepiece respirators at capturing nanoparticles? Rangasamy et al. measured the filtration efficiency of a variety of filtering facepiece respirators using sodium chloride particles ranging in diameter from 20 nanometers to 400 nanometers. They were able to show that penetration is greater through filtering facepiece respirators for nanoparticles, though smaller than 100 nanometers in diameter, than it was for 300 nanometer particles, which is the size at which efficiency is tested for respiratory protection filters. For example, the top left figure shows the percent of particles penetrating through two different N95 filtering facepiece respirators on the vertical axis as a function of particle diameter on the horizontal axis. For both respirators, there is on the order of 1% penetration at 300 nanometers, whereas at 30 to 40 nanometers, the penetration is about 2 and 4%. These data suggest that NIOSH should consider testing the efficiency of respirator filters using particles in the nanoscale range when they certify respirators instead of focusing solely on 300 nanometer particles. Overall, the tested filters perform pretty well relative to their rated efficiencies. In addition, we must keep in mind that the fit of a respirator to the wearer's face is more important than the filter penetration because it's more likely that particles will pass around the filter through a leak than to pass through it. What happens when we look at even smaller nanoparticles? In another paper, Rangasamy and co-authors used both sodium chloride particles and silver nanoparticles to measure the efficiency of a variety of filtering facepiece respirators. As the graphs of penetration versus particle diameter show, the authors demonstrated that the most penetrating particle size is about 40 nanometers. This is not unexpected because filtration theory for filters made from fibers that carry electrostatic charges, like those used in most respirator filters, indicates that the most penetrating particle size should be smaller than 100 nanometers. For particles smaller than 40 nanometers, the penetration decreases because respirator filters are highly effective at collecting the smallest nanoparticles by Brownian diffusion. 
To summarize the key points in this module, elimination is at the top of the hierarchy of control, followed by engineering controls, work practice and administrative controls, and then lowest on the hierarchy is PPE. Administrative controls for workplace exposures to nanomaterials include, in particular, proper training and hygiene procedures. Work practice controls for nanomaterial exposures include using proper handling, storage, and cleaning techniques. Lastly, chemical protective gloves and clothing and respiratory protection can reduce exposures to nanomaterials very effectively. This is an important point. We know how to control exposures to nanomaterials, we just have to apply what we know properly. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training, or METFAST program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers it does not necessarily represent the official views of the National Institutes of Health. Thanks for your attention.